This is the Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 134, Is Coke Zero Sugar Healthy? You beat the team you had to beat. Hey, look! You fit it in the dust and heat. Now you're thirsty and hot, and you know what to do. Cause there's something big waiting for me. And you Coke is in the biggest taste you have ever found. Coke is in the one that never lets you down. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logie. I run RegainWellness.com and this is the Regain Wellness Podcast. And thank you so much for joining me here today. And we're talking Coke Zero Sugar and kicking it off with a Coke Is It commercial from around 1982, which is the time that Stranger Things Season 1 was set in. And I've been like holding myself back from just starting an entire podcast all about Stranger Things. I'm a huge fan especially with season two coming out, but I won't get into it too much unless you want me to give me an email. We can discuss it all day long, but we're talking about Coke zero sugar, which is at the moment right now, a newer product just been released. And today we're looking at what it is, why it came to be, what it was based on originally and what are the potential health benefits or health problems that come with it. Um, And it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of issues with certain ingredients, artificial sweeteners, but we'll get into it all. So just before I start, two quick things. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you get it sent to you as soon as they come out. So get it wherever you get your podcast, probably iTunes, but wherever you get them. And if you're interested in sponsoring the show, I'm part of this thing called Patreon, which is kind of a crowdfunding sort of thing, but more a little simpler way where you can support on a monthly level as low as like two bucks um, to help keep the show going, like to do, so I could be able to do better shows, more shows, have more time to book great guests, the whole deal. And the, you know, it's nothing required. The show will always be free, but if it's something that interests you, go to patreoncom slash wellness and there's different levels of support. And then there's different rewards that come with it. And that's all I got to say about that. Okay. Let's get right to this. Okay. So what is Coke zero sugar? You might've seen this advertised more promoted a little differently. Um, it's got that black and red can, how, you know, people wonder why, how it's different from Diet Coke. It basically comes from Coke Zero, which was basically their earlier version of kind of cracking into the men's market of Diet Cola. There's, there's always sort of been the stigma that Diet Coke has been associated as a, a female drink and just more um, preferential to girls or whatever. And Coke was trying to target in on more of a male demographic. So that's why they went with the more aggressive looking color scheme with the black and red. I don't know. I find that funny. And then calling it Coke zero, which essentially at the time meant Coke zero sugar, but there was a real confusion what Coke zero was, believe it or not. I don't know if you've tried it before. Um, it's like, I don't know. It, the original Coke zero is it's, closer to a Coke flavor, but obviously not as much because there's no, you know, sugar base to it. There's no high fructose corn syrup, giving it more of that syrupy kind of flavor and texture and whatnot. So, but it is different than a diet Coke. And if you've had them, you, you've obviously, um, you could probably tell the difference. So the issue here now is that most people had no idea what it was and who it was geared for. So that's kind of the re basically the rebranding as Coke zero sugar. And it's not exactly the same product, but a little bit different. And it's as much, maybe more a marketing move because it wasn't moving as much. And I think there's a more um, companies are taking bigger strides to try to be healthier, you know, and to avoid sugar and fast food companies are doing the same thing. They're trying to do, I mean, you can get kale salads at McDonald's, which I think is hilarious. And I think it's okay. I mean, originally, if you think the idea of when you go to McDonald's, you know exactly why you're going to McDonald's. It's like going to Taco Bell at three in the morning when you're hammered, you're not going for a healthy meal experience. And that's usually the association with McDonald's. You know what you're getting and that's why you're going into it. So now with places like McDonald's trying to be all things to all people, I think it kind of loses their way. Like what makes these companies successful is they do one thing and they do that thing very well. And when you kind of spread it a little thin, I don't know, but I mean, McDonald's are everywhere and people still want to have a better option. But like if I'm going to McDonald's, there's 
a ton of places I can get healthier food that I'm probably going to go to beforehand. But if I want, I don't do this often. And I honestly really don't eat a lot of fast food anymore. But if I want a McDouble or a McChicken, I'm going to McDonald's because they do that better than anybody else. So the, the companies have been trying to take steps to promote themselves as healthy. And I think putting the actual word zero sugar on your label and your product is trying to reach out. Um, so whether it's just the rebranding, Coke says it's uh, got an even better, unique blend of flavors. I'm quoting here. And a lot of people, I guess, were not happy that they were introducing this whole new thing. And you know, if you're looking at the differences between Okay, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, and Coke Zero Sugar are essentially a zero-calorie, no-sugar diet option. And there's a little bit of difference between them. Um, It's like Honestly, they're pretty much the same drink. I think Diet Coke is only different by a couple. So if I'm looking here, Diet Coke contains carbonated water, caramel color, aspartame, phosphoric acid, potassium benzoate, natural flavor, citric acid, and caffeine. Coke Zero had... Carbonated water, caramel color, phosphoric acid, aspartame, potassium, benzoate, natural flavors, potassium citrate, acyl, I can never say this, acyl sulfame, potassium, and caffeine. So now you look at Coke Zero Sugar, exactly the same ingredients as Coke Zero. There's no changes. Everything's the same right across that. So Diet Coke is different because it's missing two ingredients that Coke Zero and Coke Zero Sugar have. They're missing the potassium citrate and the acesulfame potassium. And that acesulfame potassium is basically another sort of calorie-free sugar substitute. And potassium citrate is a common additive in a lot of beverages. And Diet Coke, if you've had Diet Coke and a Coke Zero or Coke Zero Sugar, to me, Diet Coke tastes thinner. I don't know if, probably not the best ways to describe it, but it, it doesn't, I mean, there's there's no sugar, there's no high fructose corn syrup, so you don't get that mouthfeel of that sort of heaviness. But between those two, I'd say, yeah, there's just this thinness to Diet Coke. I don't know what it is. Where I'd say Coke Zero and the Coke Zero Sugar are maybe a little closer flavor-wise, and it might be because of these two different things. So when you're looking at the nutrition, well, there's basically lack of nutrition. That's the whole idea. It's sugar-free. They're pretty much the same between Diet Coke, Coke Zero, and Coke Zero Sugar. So I think they're exactly the same looking here. Obviously, zero calories, zero grams of fat, 40 milligrams of sodium, zero grams total carbs, zero gram protein. And that's the same all across the board there. And then so ultimately, it comes down to taste, and that's what they're trying to go after. And they've tried to you know do those taste test studies, and actually the Huffington Post did one between – Diet Coke and Coke Zero when it came back out because um, a lot of people would are highly allegiance to one or the other. And so back in 2012, only 54% of tasters were able to tell the difference between Diet Coke and Coke Zero. And so the thing now is Coke Zero was trying, I originally was trying to push the fact like this is just like real Coke and it just t- it tastes so close to real Coke, which I don't think it does closer than the Diet Coke. So the thing is now, as they've rebranded it, they're not trying to say with Coke Zero Sugar that it is closer to Coke flavor. They're saying Coke Zero Sugar is going to taste just like Coke Zero. So whether it's, you know, they're trying to create a past sort of allegiance um, and people were maybe more committed to Coke Zero than they realize, and they're trying to get back onto that bandwagon. It's If you want to read an interesting thing, read the history of New Coke. So if you grew up in the 80s, you'll remember what New Coke was. Coke Classic had been around since the, whatever, early 20s, even before that, actually. And it always been Coca-Cola Classic. So then in 80, I don't know if it's 84, when they did it with Ray Charles, the whole promotional thing, they introduced new Coke. So they changed the recipe a bit, changed the flavor, and it was a just like catastrophe public relations wise. And as far as how public and the society viewed this new product and people were up in arms and outraged that they would mess with something that's like classic and part of Americana and people boycotted it and yeah, up in arms the whole deal that made them, um, sorry, it was always just regular Coke, so it made Coke reintroduce the original Coke and call it then Coca-Cola Classic. So that's now when you get, when you're buying it in bottles or cans, it says Coca-Cola Classic. 
because of this huge um, catastrophe of uh, marketing and rebranding. But some say it was either the, some of the biggest foresight in marketing history or one of the biggest genius moves. And it was completely an intentional move to completely swap the recipe, change the flavor, have the public get outrage, and then reissue back in what they didn't know they were missing. And that the whole thing was completely intentional to kind of create more nostalgia and more allegiance to the original Coke. So in either case, it's very interesting, whether it's um, absolute, you know, no no sense of foresight or brilliant marketing. So there's tons of... um, essays and YouTube videos and stuff on that, the whole thing about new Coke. So if you're ever bored, check it out. So I'm going to get into some of the specific ingredients and a little focus on the artificial sweetener aspect. But the first thing off is it's, I mean, straight up, it's going to be better to avoid sugar whenever possible, especially liquid sugar. If there's one big tip I can give people, it's don't drink your calories, um, especially in the form of sugar, whether it's soft drinks fruit juices, sports drinks, energy drinks. It's when you're drinking a liquid form of sugar, it's like drinking a chocolate bar, but in most cases, a high fructose corn syrup version. Now there's different products now that they've tried. People are more aware of the dangers of high fructose corn syrup. It's it's like rocket fuel to what it does to your body. Um, it goes straight to your liver. It, it has this whole bypass process. Um, and your liver has to go and handle it first and it can lead to what they call non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome, which like 40 plus 50 plus, um, million people have to deal with where it's just rotting your liver out. That's the problem with fructose in a liquid form. And that's one of the issues with fruit juices is that it is pure fructose. Fructose can be okay, but it needs to be in its fruit package where there's you know, fiber and roughage and it slows the absorption down. When it's in a liquid form, it's an instant absorption, again, straight to your liver. And then that's when the havoc comes in, let alone the fact it can lead, you know, to spiked insulin levels, um, you know, blood sugar up and down, uh, leading to cravings, um, creating, you know, insulin resistance and, you know, the potential for, you know, type 2 diabetes and obviously obesity and then, things like heart disease and the whole deal. So when you, you you know, with this high fructose corn syrup, it's just absolute poison. It's the only way to put it. High fructose corn syrup is really, think of it as like a preservative and it can replace sugar because it's crazy cheaper than regular sugar. As um, sort of the decades have gone on and the cost of sugar and tariffs have gone up and, you know, most sugar comes from either sugar cane or beets, um, and the countries that produce those, again, the tariffs go up. High fructose corn syrup is is microscopically cheaper. Um, it's more plentiful. I mean, we grow a majority of all the corn that's used for it here in North America. Actually, 70% of the corn that is grown across North America is not even for human consumption. It's meant for things like this, like high fructose corn syrup or animal feeds or whatnot. So, I mean, the cheapness factor is the reason why drinks have been able to become so huge um, think back to like when you're a kid, like the smaller sizes at McDonald's for soft drink or 7-Eleven or whatever. And now there's these monstrosity drinks that are just like the size of a Buick hatchback. And I don't think a Buick hatchback is even a car, but a, <laughs> something giant. And they've been able to increase the size of these things basically with no cost increase to the manufacturers because of the cheapness of high fructose corn syrup. And again, it sort of like acts like a preserve as well too, not just in soft drinks, but in other foods, they'll use high fructose corn syrup because it kind of replace, like if they're taking say fat over a product to make something more of a low fat option, they need to kind of put that flavor and that mouthfeel back for people to actually crave and want the food. Um, and that's one of, it's like trans fats. It's one of those things that can go in to replace um, anything natural they are taking out of it out of it and it has a longer shelf life. So there's, you know, lower overhead costs, less wastages. So kind of a double, um, aspect behind things like high fructose corn syrup. And it's maybe more addictive and that might be a whole other reason as well too, why it's, you know, you know, use it as a priority in a lot of these products. So whenever you can be avoiding sugar, especially in liquid form, that's ideal. So avoiding a regular Coke is going to be good. And then, you know, in theory, turning to a Diet Coke or a Coke Zero Sugar is a better choice. Um, 
so so because there's still issues that come with these artificial flavors and stuff i'm gonna say just straight up um like i talk a lot of crap about artificial sweeteners and flavors and the problems they can lead to which i'll get to in a sec ultimately it's going to be better to avoid sugar and go for something like this but i would not depend on these drinks and make them a regular habit all the time so let's take a look at some of the actual ingredients that are in a coke zero sugar and which are you know in a lot of uh diet soft drinks as um as it were i'd say the first thing is you're looking at the caffeine content now granted there's not a ton compared to like an espresso or a red bull or whatever but the difference is you know caffeine from a clean source like you know, real fresh coffee or green tea or whatever, actually not bad for you. I mean, to a point, you don't want to go more than um, a cup or two a day, um, just getting into potential habit forming issues. And, you know, but there are some health benefits that come from caffeine. Um, The problem is that's not in something like this. These are using like a synthetic type of caffeine. Um, And then this constant exposure can, you know, raise blood pressure cause you know things like heartburn it can obviously impact your sleep it can lead to ulcers uh indigestion anxiety the whole deal um when you put that together with you know an artificial sweetener as well and then the you know the caffeine thing with a lot of these ingredients you're basically they got a a built-in thirst mechanism that these drinks create Um, any any soda as well too whether it's like a Coke or whatever it at the same time, they're promoting dehydration and thirst. So it's, you know, the double whammy that causes you to keep drinking more. The caffeine is, um, you know, can cause a loss of water through, you know, more frequent urination. It's basically a, a diuretic. And then these different drinks will have some form of a sodium, um, or a potassium or a, you know, something that can increase thirst. So that content of it keeps you thirsty. You add in the addictive properties of the caffeine. um, And then you've got, you know, something that is causing you to lose water. So your body needs more, but it's still craving it because of the sodium potassium issue. Um, and the fact that you're never satisfied when you have something that's like artificially flavored or, you know, something like that contains MSG, you want more of it, more of it, you're basically never satiated from it. So it causes you to continue to crave it. Uh, the next, uh, an interesting ingredient that is in this is that, um, phosphoric acid. And you might wonder why this is an ingredient and why this exists. It basically helps give a kind of that sharp taste to anything that's a cola base. Um, In the case of real Coke or real sugar Coke, it actually slows down the growth of molds and bacteria, which normally multiply rapidly in a sugar solution. So in the case of a drink that doesn't have sugar, it's, it's just in there for that sort of bite flavor. But the problem is phosphoric acid can lead to low mineral bone density and even like things like osteoporosis. So, and again, it's specific to colas and it, like you won't find phosphoric acid in like Sprite or 7-Up or any clear sodas. It's more, it's cola based. So that's my thought and why they put it in is it's more for to kind of recreate that cola kind of bite sort of flavor thing. Um, not as a way to combat the potential bacteria and mold growth that can come from the sugar. So the problem is the first thing that um, this acid hits is your teeth and it can cause tooth enamel erosion even at low levels so think of you know this stuff can be used to like you know it's why they say that coke can be used to clean porcelain and toilets because it can break down any of that sort of mildewy scummy whatever that's on porcelain because it can do the same thing to your bones Um, so obviously not just your teeth but your bones in general another one that's never never really looked at as an ingredient and you know it's the first one right off the bat carbonated water so you got to think of this as an actual harmful ingredient because tap water in general is not the cleanest thing in the world and again depending where you live it's worse than in others and there is a ton of you know even even if you in your kitchen sink 
which is going to be one of the better forms of a, you know, a natural, well, I don't want to say natural, but um, available water that is for consumption still has a lot of stuff in it that I'm sure you're aware of, not just from the fluoride issue, but the potential exposure to, you know, they find all the stuff that can get into our water supplies and, you know, even medications and all the kind of crap that's disposed of that comes in contact and it's not treated as, as long with other, you know, potential chlorines and other things. And this is our good tap water. When you're looking at something like a mass produced beverage, you're looking at them using the cheapest municipal water sources they can find. And these sources tend, again, depending where you're from, where you live, they can contain like huge amounts of chlorine, um, which have been linked to, you know, bladder, rectal, breast cancers, the whole deal, plus whatever other crap is found its way in there. And it's, you know, carbonated. So it's acts as, you know, it's a way to, with carbonation, it's kind of another craving mechanism that we want in a drink. A lot of the times when people want a soda or something like that, it's a lot of times it's the bubbles they, they crave and that sort of sensation from it. So with the carbonated water, um, it masks, you know, any of the potential flavors that might have been in that municipal water supply to start with, not to mention all the other artificial flavors and flavorings that go on to create the whole beverage as a whole. So, I mean, you know, people, you might have a filter on your tap, which I think is a good idea, or you might use a Brita filter jug in your fridge, which I think is another good idea. Like people are aware of this and this is the water in their home, which is vastly better than say these yeah big municipal water supplies that the giant companies are going to use. So it's something to think of as an ingredient and as a potential harmful ingredient. And I'll cover now, which I think is the most harmful ingredient by far. And that is the aspartame issue. And whether it's any other form of artificial sweetener, aspartame can take the form of many different ingredients. So they'll like, um, it can be listed as like NutraSweet, Equal, Sweet and Low, Sweet Twin, Sugar Twin, Splenda, Sunnet, Sweet One. This is just aspartame, you know, and then, you know, sucralose is its whole other thing. But the big companies tend to use aspartame, especially Coke. Um, they've started, like I was talking earlier, the, they had, they've issued out a few other drinks. One was called Coke, uh, life. I think it was, um, it was in that or Coke new life or whatever. It was in that green kind of, um, packaging green and white. It looked like a healthier thing. And they, you know, they removed the high fructose corn syrup. They replaced it with regular sugar, which they is, you know, just kind of assumed to be better. Or they use like a cane sugar or whatever. It also took out the aspartame and it used stevia instead. So I think, you know, good strides as, as more and more people are becoming aware of things they want to avoid, avoid and people are aware of artificial sweeteners causing some real issues. And like I said, it can, you know, with Coke and the big beverage companies, aspartame tends to be the go-to, but remember it can hide under these different forms that I just mentioned. So here's the quick rundown on aspartame. And I've covered this a lot. So I really recommend listening to a couple of the shows I did all about artificial sweeteners and aspartames. And I'll link those up on the show notes. So if you go to regainwellness.com slash 134, I've got these big shows. Uh, to me, it's one of the most interesting subjects ever in the whole, not even to, not even food related, but um, politics wise. So, so here's the quick, here's the Coles note version. And hopefully I don't go off the rails here. Um, aspartame was discovered by accident by a chemist in 1965 named James M. Schlatter, who was working for JD, sorry, GD Cyril, which is now owned by Monsanto, the big chemical company. So they were actually looking for an ulcer medication and whatever the concoction he came up with, he had accidentally licked his fingers to turn the page of something and he had been in contact with what is now aspartame, um, which was derived from ethanol, and he was astounded at its sweet taste. So they, you know, made note of this discovery, and it was actually not really recognized until 1969. And then during there's sort of a low calorie movement in the 70s, and they started to see that there was a potential use for uh, this sugar substitute, and it was a 
you know, potential great financial opportunity. So originally the FDA disproved of aspartame. This is in 1980. And the team of scientists that they used to investigate it was re- reporting that it might induce brain tumors. Um, there was right off the bat, they saw the potential. I mean, it's a chemical. They, they just saw what this thing was possibly causing and side effects it was creating. So that this is where it gets sort of all Michael Murray. Um, it was, so the, the disapproval was challenged by then serial chair, chairman and future secretary of defense, Donald Rumsfeld, who vowed to call on his markers to get it approved. And, you know, having a lot of former connections in Washington, he would look, you know, for his political pull in Washington to make it happen rather than by, you know, scientific means to get this stuff approved. So when Ronald Reagan became president in 1981, the very next day, you can look all this stuff up and I have this all linked in the articles and the show notes I've done on aspartame. But the next day he appoints a new head of the FDA called Arthur Hall Hayes, who was handpicked by Donald Rumsfeld as part of Reagan's transition team. And he starts a commission to question the original disapproval by the board on aspartame. So they look at it again. The five person panel votes three to two to uphold the ban. They're like, no deal. People should not be consuming this crap. So this guy Hayes, the new head of the FDA then appoints a six member that he chooses who ends up surprise deadlocking the vote three to three. Then this Hayes guy decides he'll be the tie-breaking vote. And obviously, what do you think? He votes in favor of aspartame. Then interestingly, well, not interesting. You can see this is where this is going. This Hayes guy later leaves the FDA under allegations of impropriety, which included him riding in the General Foods private jet. And General Foods was one of the first major customers of NutraSweet, which was the commercial brand of aspartame. And then the guy ends up taking a job with Burstyn Marsteller, which is the chief public relations firm for both Monsanto and J.D. Cyril. So, I mean, as usual as it tends to be, there's no interest in the public's health. And it, it, there's no surprise in me saying that commercial endeavors and profit trump any form of responsibility to public citizens. I mean, that just it does go without saying um, with the interests of big companies and whatnot, especially like a giant company like Monsanto. Um, so, I mean, that's where aspartame comes from. It, it, it's, its background is so shady to start with. And when they first started using it, it was only in like things like dry food goods, you know, maybe cereal, which seems weird. Um, but, you know, they could keep the sugar down. And it, was th- it was in things like chewing gum and it, you know, came a lot as, as sweet and low. But the big kind of rise of aspartame in general comes in 1983 and that's when Diet Coke was first introduced um, into the public. And so then there was a mass production of it. There was more demand and there was more aspartame consumption now than ever in human history because ev- everyone at some point had a Diet Coke, but especially back then when it was first introduced. And it was interesting, like people were still not sure of this. So like, how can something taste this sweet? Aspartame is like, it's not like 60 times sugar or sorry, 60 times sweeter than regular sugar um, just from this chemical concoction. So even back then there's articles from the New York times about people are wondering, is this stuff actually healthy? Should we be consuming it? So but like people were aware back in 83. Um, so here's how an, a chemical sweetener works in the body. So first off it acts as what they call an excitotoxin in the brain. So this can, can, ta- can cause potential nerve damage and this little, it's, it's like minor, minor, microscopic little nerve damage, which is associated with that sort of buzz that you get from consuming a diet soda. Um, and then there's concern that the long-term exposure of these excitotoxins have not only addictive properties, but can, you know, connected to long-term cognitive issues like multiple sclerosis or ALS, brain lesions, Parkinson's disease, um, that whole thing. And then, so when you're looking at the, you know, that one of the ingredients that make up aspartame, it's made up of, um, aspartic acid, phenylalanine and methanol. Those are the three things which do not sound too natural, do they? So in the case of methanol in the body, it's oxidated into formaldehyde, the the same formaldehyde they use to preserve bodies. And it's a known carcinogen. It's linked to things like retinal damage, birth defects, um, 
you know, if you if you talk to heavy diet soda drinkers, they sometimes will reveal these vision problems they have. And there's this idea that airline pilots or for whatever, for a while, we're not allowed to consume artificial sweeteners or aspartame because of the potential um, visual retinal problems it may cause when they're flying planes. I don't know if this is true or not. It was just something I remember hearing. So the point is aspartame is pretty bad stuff and it's so bad that there's an actual aspartame toxicity center that's a real thing run by the government that would record and report on all the the different potential issues um, that aspartame can cause so in the body it's does some weird stuff as well when it comes to the fact that it tricks the body into um, thinking it's consumed some sort of actual sugar so you know, your body tastes something sweet and it's used to having a sweet taste followed by a certain amount of sugar and calorie calories to follow it. So when you have an artificial sweetener, that's not the case. So since there's no calories coming in the body, your body's still sort of craving what it thinks it was about to receive. And that can lead to actually more cravings for like carbohydrates and sugar, which can actually cause overeating. And you know, it's kind of ironic with a diet based drink that it can lead to more food consumption because your body's just like kind of, it's not that it's starving, but it, it's craving, um, what it thought it was going to get. It's like when you eat something that has no nutrition in it, like say, um, like a Twinkie or whatever, you're, you're still going through the act of eating and digestion and absorption, but there's your body's eating, but it's not getting any nutrition. And it, that's the whole reason we eat. So your body would consume something like a bunch of Twinkies, but it's still starving uh, on a cellular level. It's still starving for nutrition. It didn't get the nutrition it believed it's supposed to receive from the act of eating. And it's the same thing with an artificial sweetener. <clears throat> your body's waiting for the sugar and it doesn't get it. So it continues to crave it. Um, the sugar. And at the same time, it has those addictive properties, like I was saying. So your body wants more of the aspartame containing product that also has the caffeine. And, you know, it, you're basically losing a battle here against your brain. Like the, the way this can manipulate your whole body is incredible. It, it's it's safe to say like it is like a lower level drug. It's like a narcotic, the way it hijacks our brain into wanting and craving it and then leading to other problems. So that's that's the quick rundown on aspartame. Again, listen to the whole shows I've got on it that I'll link up, regainwellness.com slash 134. So that's the, the main issue with this today where we're talking about this Coke Zero Sugar is you're trading in one problem with the sugar for another with all these other artificial ingredients and artificial flavors and crappy water and artificial sweeteners and um, phosphoric acids and the whole deal. So I, you cannot call this thing a healthy choice at all. There's always the question in nutrition or in health or whatever, like which one of these two things is better. And, and the ant, like people are looking for to be recommended one or the other. And you know, the answer is a lot of the time it's neither. I would say first off, if it came between a Coke and a Coke Zero Sugar, the Coke Zero Sugar is the better choice because anytime you can avoid sugar, that's the best option. So in that situation, yeah. To say it's a healthy choice in general, no, not even close. You're better off going with a sparkling like mineral water, add in your own, you know, so throw in some fresh squeezed lemon and lime. That That's going to be your better choice all the time. I'd say occasionally yeah it who gives a crap it's not a big deal you, you know if you're having it every now and then whatever you, you'd, be, you'd be amazed how resilient your body is it can handle quite a lot it just can't handle constant exposure even at on a small dosage over time that's what leads to problems but if you're you know you're doing well you're drinking clean products and clean water um you're eating well when you have something you know whatever whether it's you know chocolate or dessert and it's 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 occasionally you know the exposure to it your body can handle that stuff extremely well and on the side you might you know not feel so great after anyway 
and it'll kind of, you know, motivate you to not have those things again. But as far as how your body can process and handle things, it's, it's amazingly resilient as long as it's not a constant exposure. I'll say that one thing I, I find that's become an issue is the idea of moderation. And this is leading to exactly what I'm talking about. There's kind of been this idea that anything in moderation is okay, but over the long term, it's still, you know, like, oh, I, you know, I exercise and I do whatever, but I have a little bit of this each day or a little bit of that. And over the long term, that stuff still adds up because you're constantly exposed to it. And the big issue with moderation when people think they're being healthy by, oh, I'm not constantly exposing myself to this, I'm having it in moderation. Most people's moderation is actually not moderation. And it's in your mind, you've, you know, convinced yourself, oh, I'm only, you know, having this much when in reality, it's probably way too much. Um, and even when you look at someone else, what your moderate may, might be could be a huge amount to someone else. And it's all, and, and then over time it gets a little more and a little more. And then this moderation still appears to be moderation and it's growing and it's more exposure to something that's very detrimental to health. So as in, as opposed to this moderation thing, just pick, you know, a day, you know, whether you want to call it a cheat day or a cheat meal and, you know, whether it's on a Sunday or every couple of weeks and you have this odd thing, honestly, that's not going to make a big difference. And it probably psychologically, it's probably going to be good for you too, because it's going to give you that relief. Um, or if you're craving these things and whatnot, it's just, you know, if you have that bit and bit each day, it grows and grows and, and that's how it gets out of hand. But just, it's just from a body and physiological aspect, your body can take quite a bit and it's actually made to handle these things. In the case of say like a cheat meal or a cheat day or something like that, when you start eating a lot of, you know, crap or whatnot can actually have a positive effect on your metabolism. And if you're, you know, working out and training or trying to build muscle and lose body fat, it can actually work in your favor. If you're eating, say you're going like two or three weeks where you're eating super clean and there's, you know, no garbage in there and no sugars and whatever, your body starts humming along pretty well metabolically. It's able to handle, um, you know, it's, it knows it's getting a regular dose of good nutrition. Things can settle in and kind of run along all, I don't want to say on autopilot, but almost like on cruise control, it doesn't need a lot of energy to process these things. And it, it just settles in when you throw a whole bunch, say a giant fast food meal or a whole pizza at one point, everything has to spring into action because now there's this huge influx of calories and ingredients and stuff and your body's got to process it. And digested and that takes a ton of energy it can actually boost your metabolism and it can actually help your body burn some body fat and stuff like that i notice like days where again this isn't for everybody but days where i've you know been eating super clean for a while and then i'd have a day where i had you know a panzerati the size of a buick hatchback if that exists and you're expecting to you know look like hell the next day and you'd actually look a bit leaner because your metabolism's bumped up. Your body's burn more calories to handle this, you know, inferior influx of high calorie junk. So this can actually have a place, um, you know, in, if you're looking aesthetically to, you know, build muscle and lose fat and the whole deal. So that's what I mean. Every now and then, yeah, I, th I think these, these things are okay to have. It's just, it's, it's better to do that than have that, you know, little bit each day that adds up over the long term. So I think I'll cut it off there. Hopefully I covered this whole thing. It, it, it's not just about this specific product, this Coke Zero Sugar, but looking at anytime these things are introduced and what they mean and are they healthy uh, choices. Cause anytime something like this comes up, I, it, I've get, I get asked whether I've worked in gyms or people emailing me or whatever, like, is this healthy? That's always a question. Is this a healthy choice? So uh, hopefully it's clear the answer with, in this case, Coke zero sugar. No, it's not healthy. Um, is it a better choice than other things? Yes. Um, should it be a constant go-to? No, there's better things you should be having anyway, but every now and then I don't think it's a big deal. And if it's one or the other between that and a Coke. Yes, it's a better choice, but water at the end of the day is going to be the best choice for any type of beverage. So that's it. If you want to hear more, um, or if you had more questions, 
or you want to talk stranger things like I talked at the start of the show, email me at info at regainwellness.com and we can go into anything else. Cause it's, it's a huge big subject that kind of goes down a bunch of different rabbit holes. Like you can see just with the artificial sweetener aspartame issue, what that's all about. And again, regainwellness.com slash one, three, four, and I'll link up a bunch of those other episodes um, that I think you'll find interesting because I think it's an interesting subject. Okay. So let's cut it off there. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the, the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts and I'll be back very soon. Okay. Bye.